And now a prayer for listening hearts and minds. Loving creator, you are a fount of wonder and wisdom. Open our hearts anew as scripture is read to receive these good gifts that we might grow on our journeys with you. Amen. Our scripture reading. So last Sunday, we read the story of two midwives who engaged in creative resistance to the harm and destruction of Pharaoh sought for all the baby boys of the Hebrew people during their enslavement in Egypt. Today, we return to the story of the Hebrew people in Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. And a lot happens between when baby Moses is saved by the midwives, his mother, and Pharaoh's daughter, each engaged in creative resistance in their own way. Here's the extremely quick summary. Moses is raised in Pharaoh's home by Pharaoh's daughter, yet eventually finds out he is one of the Hebrew people. One day he sees an Egyptian beating one of his Hebrew kinsfolk and kills the Egyptian for doing so. Moses is then forced to flee Egypt. He settles in Midian as a shepherd. There, God appears in a burning bush and calls Moses to return to Egypt to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery. Moses answers God's call, though not without protesting. Moses returns to Egypt and along with his brother Aaron goes to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh that the God of Israel decrees, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. And so, at God's direction, Moses and Aaron unleash a series of so-called plagues upon Egypt to press Pharaoh to let the people go. The plagues include turning the Nile River to blood, frogs everywhere, gnats everywhere, flies everywhere, a livestock disease that killed all Egyptian livestock, festering boils on humans and animals, hail and falling fire, swarming locusts and dense darkness for three days. Despite all these afflictions, Pharaoh still will not let the Hebrew people go. And so God has Moses warn Pharaoh about the last plague, that all the firstborn in Egypt, human and livestock, will die. God then gives Moses and Aaron instructions to give to all the Israelites on how to prepare for this event, now called Passover. The instructions for Passover preparations are detailed in today's scripture reading, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 14, selected verses. Let us listen now carefully that we might hear God's holy wisdom for us today. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. You shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a remembrance for you 
You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Friends, as we turn to reflect on this scripture, please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I dare say we all have those things that don't sit well with us. Every honest person of faith does. And as I know I've shared with some of you before, the plagues are one of those parts of scripture for me. I struggle with them mightily. For as Pastor Laura previewed for us, when we read the Bible as a whole, I see a God who is passionately in love with all and loves all people and seeks the goodness and wholeness of all. This is the God to whom I cling, the God in whom I readily place my trust. And yet, while in the story of the plagues I see and affirm God's passion for loosing the bonds of injustice and seeking the liberation of all who are oppressed, I also see great destruction and heartache wrought upon the Egyptians purportedly at God's direction and by God's power and that that doesn't sit well with me. The part of me that loves clear boundaries and clear lines of right versus wrong wants God's name nowhere near the killing of life, even if it's supposedly in service to liberation. Contemplating all of this again this week, I was reminded of a blog post from a few years ago by a friend of mine, the rabbi Adam Raskin. Back in early April 2020, with much of the country under shelter-in-place orders as the COVID-19 pandemic began sweeping across the country, the annual Jewish remembrance of Passover was also quickly approaching. At that time, Rabbi Raskin shared in a blog post that he received a voicemail from a congregant with a throbbing faith concern. The congregant asked, How do we talk about the ten plagues at the Seder, the meal commemorating the first Passover, when there is a plague going on right now in our world? In response to this concern, Raskin offered several helpful perspectives for his Jewish kinfolk and us. He wrote, As we attempt to navigate between modernity and antiquity, it is critically important to distinguish between scientific and biblical language. Pandemic is a diagnostic term for a disease that affects a large number of people worldwide. A plague, in the religious sense, is an exceptional phenomenon wielded by God for a variety of instructive purposes, to punish, to teach, to display God's power, over other deities, whether we read biblical plagues as historical accounts or as sacred metaphors, a plague is by definition limited to the time and place of the Bible. We must be very careful not to ascribe theological causation to modern sickness, storms, natural disasters, or other inexplicable misfortunes. Raskin continued, writing, a pandemic is not a plague, and what God may have done countless generations ago is not the way God acts in the world today. If Jewish religious history is anything, it is a description of God's constantly changing strategies for bringing goodness and righteousness into the world. Now, while I find great wisdom in all of Rabbi Raskin's reflections and reminders. It's that last piece that I find myself needing to hear again and again and again, regardless of how many times I've heard it before. If Jewish religious history, the ancient stories of our ancestors in faith is anything, it is a description of God's constantly changing strategies for bringing goodness 
and righteousness into the world. We may want things to be clean and neat. God only brings life. God does not destroy. God works only through peaceful means to bring justice and liberation for the oppressed. God never changes God mi God's mind. But the reality is, people throughout history, generations of our ancestors in faith, have seen and experienced the same tensions we do. Life including an authentic, engaged, growing life of faith is full of difficult both ands. God is both loving, justice seeking, and liberation giving, and there are times when destruction is required in pursuit of God's dreams of goodness and righteousness in all the world. God is both wiser than we can imagine, and God does change and adapt. We can both question God and have deep faith in God. There can be both new life and hope in the world through God's love and power, and bad things can happen to anyone at any time. Sometimes we just have to rest in the discomfort of those, both, of those difficult both ands of life and faith, trusting in God's power to bring goodness and life from the creative tension. I was pondering all of this when suddenly this past Thursday night, I found myself in the midst of several both and situations back to back. I'll share just one. Thursday evening, I was sitting in the sanctuary of First Presbyterian Church of Red Wing, Minnesota, for a meeting of the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area, the regional church body of which we are a part. The meeting began with the customary and boring reports. And then about an hour in, we came to a report from an administrative commission, which is church talk for a group of people specifically elected and charged with the task of attending to a challenging situation, usually a church in deep conflict or a church that is closing. This administrative commission had ended up doing both, navigating church conflict and eventually walking a congregation in South Minneapolis through closure. Now, I was a bit surprised to see a report from this commission on the docket for the meeting because I had remembered that a year, almost a year ago, last November, they had brought a report and a recommendation to close the congregation. I frankly thought they'd finish their work. But when I realized what the commission was now recommending, I was actually very heartened, deeply, deeply heartened. Because what the commission did is bring a recommendation to sell the building where the now closed congregation had resided to an organization called Flourish Placemaking Collaborative. This is a Twin Cities-based organization that which works with churches and community partners to repurpose and reimagine underutilized church spaces in ways that cultivate spaces of belonging for the flourishing of all. Even more than that, the recommendation was to sell the building not for the appraised value, but rather for a far lower sum, a sum that would be enough to satisfy the remaining mortgage and provide gifts to agencies engaged in restorative and reparative justice work for black and indigenous communities in the Minneapolis area. Friends, this recommendation passed nearly unanimously. And maybe that doesn't sound like a big deal. Maybe that just sounds like the church doing what Jesus always asks us to do, put community and collective flourishing above personal gain and wealth. But when it finally hit me what had just happened, I was blown away with awe at how God had brought transformation and movement toward liberation out of mess and struggle in just a few short years. Because friends, I can remember only about three or four years ago when the Presbytery voted to sell another property of a recently closed congregation. 
That building was, at the time, housing a vibrant Hispanic worshiping community. But when the market was heating up, the recommendation came to sell the, build the property to a developer at the highest possible price. Little, if any, work was done to see if a creative arrangement could be reached with the Hispanic worshiping community so that they could remain in the building and take it over. Little, if any, work was even done to see if we could find a developer who was committed to using the property to build housing for low-wage workers. We simply sold the building for top dollar. So truly, it was moving and memorable and spirit-filled. Now, a few short years later, to witness the Presbytery selling a building not for top dollar, but at zero profit and to an organization committed to building up neighbors and communities and places of belonging as Christ teaches us to do. And, and, it was complicated and messy and all tinged with a bit of sadness even in the meeting. Because there were a few folks at the meeting Thursday night who had been members of the now closed congregation who came with questions and I think also concerns. But because of the rules of the meeting, these couple of folks were not allowed to address the body directly. While a workaround was eventually found, it was messy and it was awkward. And it was a moment in which power and privilege, voice and vote were wielded for exclusion. So the whole episode was a difficult and discomforting both and moment. It was both a moment when God's work of liberation and transformation were on display and a moment when our form of governance, which we believe is informed by God's wisdom and leading, was a silencing and exclusionary force. We can't escape them. We can't escape these difficult both and moments of life and faith. Recognizing that we do well then, beloved people of God, to remember that God is with us in these moments and spaces just as God was with our ancestors. Even more, we do well to remember that at the first Passover, in the midst of one of the most difficult both and situations ever experienced, in the moment in which our faith ancestors experienced God as both bringing about their freedom and doing so through widespread death and destruction, in that moment, I believe God gave them such detailed instructions for remembrance because God wanted the people then and wants us now to always remember two things. God is not done with us yet. God has always fought and will always fight for justice and liberation for the oppressed. And we are in this together. The difficult both ends of life and faith were never meant to be navigated on our own. We need one another. God gave us one another. So we remember together, we question together, we bind ourselves into community with those now and with all the faithful who have gone before so that together we can carry one another and care for one another, correct and guide one another as need be. Beloved people of God, the plagues and Passover are difficult both ends. Indeed, life is full of difficult both ends. But we remember them together so that we might move forward in faith together, trusting in God's power to bring goodness and life from the creative tension. May God guide us and shelter us on the journey this day and always. Amen.